This is the Comics Alternative for Young Readers, reviews of The Cardboard Kingdom all summer long, and be prepared. and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative for Young Readers. I'm Gwen. And I'm Derek. And we're two people with PhDs talking about comics for younger readers. On this episode of the Comics Alternative Young Readers Show, we will be discussing um, summer 2018 new releases, all geared to basically middle grade readers, although we'll, we'll refine that as we talk about the texts. The first book, edited and illustrated by Chad Sell, is The Cardboard Kingdom. It's released by Random House Graphic, and readers in that text will learn about the lives and dreams of a group of neighborhood kids in short stories written by Jay Fuller, David DeMio, Katie, Sh- whoa, whoa, Katie Schlinkel, Chris Moore, Molly Muldoon, Vid Alliger, Manuel Betancourt, Michael Cole, Cloud Jacobs, and Barbara Perez Marquez. The second text we'll be discussing is Hope Larson's All Summer Long from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And finally, we'll review Vera Brasco's long-awaited memoir, Be Prepared, released by First Second Books. That's right. But before we start with that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative for Young Readers is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts will be anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off of the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover. But occasionally, you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. Derek, this month, Discount Comic Book Service has the DC Kids Bundle that includes issues Scooby-Doo Team Up number 43 and Scooby-Doo Where Are You number 75 for the low price of $2.98. That's under $3 for two Scooby-Doo issues, 50% off the list price. And also, you can get one of the books we're talking about today, Vera Broskell's Be Prepared for Only $9.09, which is 30% off the cover price. Now, if you do order these awesome books from DCBS Service, be sure to tell them that Derek and Gwen sent you. That's right. Well, Derek, I wanted to let our listeners know that in August, Dr. Paul Lay earned a doctorate in education from the University of California, Berkeley, and the entire Comics Alternative family is so proud and happy for Paul. However, he has a new job with a lot of responsibilities, and he's decided, sadly, to step away from the Young Reader broadcast. Um, He has been such a wonderful co-host, and I'm honored to have been able to work with him for so many memorable shows. But beginning in October, we'll have a new regular co-host joining us. And until then, Derek, you have very kindly agreed (laughs) to step in, and we are so grateful for you bringing all of your considerable comics knowledge to bear on the books that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, you know, it, it's um, good news about Paul and his graduation and his new job, but it's unfortunate not only for the Young Reader Show, but also for the weekly review show of the Comics Alternative. Paul had just recently stepped into the role of a permanent ongoing co-host for the weekly show, but you know, understandable, he's had life changes and he has more responsibilities, and so he decided it would be better to just pull away from the weekly review show and the Young Reader Show. We're going to miss him because I thought he brought a lot Mm -hmm. to the Comics Alternative, but uh, there may be uh, some uh, other things that Paul will want to do for the Comics Alternative. So listen up in the weeks or months to come and you will hear some of these changes. 
I agree, Derek. Paul is just an amazing guy, and I'm looking forward to his continued contributions to the comics alternative once he gets um, into a new routine with his job. So uh, it's it's with a heavy heart, but I'm really happy for Paul um, that we say goodbye to him for now from the Comics Alternative Young Reader Show. But next month, we'll definitely have someone new in place who can talk about comics. So that will be exciting. Yeah, and I guess I'm the fill-in for this show, and I have to tell you, Gwen, I feel a little bit out of place because this is the very first time that I've co-hosted a show you know, in the Young Reader series, and so I'm going to rely on your expertise to keep me in line. Oh, you will be fine. And actually, we picked three really good books, um, somewhat representative of the work that's being done in middle grade comics right now. So you'll have a chance to to sort of give your opinion on those. And, and I'll be excited to hear it. And maybe we should just get going with the first book. Yeah, let's get going. So our first book today is a collaborative effort in the truest sense by Chad Sell, um, who is um, listed as the editor and illustrator for The Cardboard Kingdom. This comes to us from the Random House graphics imprint that actually was just taken over by um, Gina, right? She's uh, Didn't she just take take over for them this summer, I think, in July. Gina Gagliano, who used to be um, one of the point people at First Second Books. So Gina brings a world of experience to this text. And what's really cool, Derek, is that this is a collection of um, short stories that are written by a number of different comics creators and um, and all drawn by Sal himself. And that's kind of the cohesion that brings this together. The text is set in a suburban neighborhood and features a truly diverse and engaging group of young kids, and the stories show how imagination can function as a coping device. Um, Young reader short story collections are not entirely new. Random House has also supported the Comic Squad series, which is edited by Jennifer Holm, Matt Holm, and usually a number of guest editors will cycle through. Um, And they've included volumes on recess, lunch, and detention. My three favorite things from from grade school. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And um, basically, this short story collection boasts only one artist um, at a time, right? So if you're reading Comic Squad, you'll read a comic by Jen Holm and Matt Holm, but then you'll read another comic by someone else. They've they've put in Peanuts comics that are, you know, um, sort of excerpts from Charles Schultz's work. But there's a general theme, but each um, story stands on its own. This is different from The Cardboard Kingdom, where all of the characters continue to emerge and appear in the stories, and there's a cohesive storyline that sort of works through it about play and inventiveness. Um, And for that matter, I feel it really does have a more cohesive feel. But Derek, I know that you don't always favor short story comics collections. We were just talking about this last week. So I'm wondering what your reaction was to this particular volume. Well, you know, it's not so much that I don't privilege or don't enjoy short story collections and comics. Uh, It's just... Uh, I tend to be drawn toward longer, ongoing narratives. But, you know, the short story collections are great as well. Now, you know, one of the things that you were pointing out in terms of the difference between those earlier collections that you mentioned in Cardboard Kingdom uh, is that there seems to be more cohesion with Cell's Cardboard Kingdom. And, you know, I, as as I was reading this, I couldn't help but feel that what we have here is, I guess, an example of what I would call a graphic cycle, which would be, I guess, the comics equivalent, uh, as I've defined it, of uh, a short story cycle, or another name for short story cycle in in literary studies is composite novel. I prefer short story cycle. Uh, And I think that Cardboard Kingdom definitely fits into that uh, kind of graphic cycle definition, because each of these stories could stand alone on its Mm -hmm. own. Um, but they're nonetheless connected and not only with characters, because as you point out, there are certain characters that we see from one story to the next and, and some characters become kind of major figures, right? Especially mm-hmm. the first one, uh, that we see in the story, the sorceress. Um, I, I think he it becomes the most prominent, 
but also there are storylines uh, mm-hmm. that are woven throughout. So not only do you have a character that is recurring from one story to the next, but you also have certain narratives or storylines that keep cropping up again and again. And so there's something somewhat novelistic, I think, about Cardboard Kingdom, but at the same time, it is a collection of stories. But nonetheless, they're connected in ways that you and I have discussed. And so that's why I would call it a graphic cycle. Yeah. And, you know, one of the major themes in this text is the importance of imagination. Mm-hmm. Um, and let maybe I'll just talk a little bit about the opening vignette, um, because here we have um, a young kid who is pretending to be a sorceress. And the children in this neighborhood are very creative and using cardboard, hence the name Cardboard Kingdom, to come up with these fantastic costumes. And what's really cool is you get a sense for how they see themselves imaginatively, but you're also seeing what they actually look like. So there's that really neat juxtaposition of how they're imagining themselves dressed up and what we would actually see if we were looking at them, if we walked into a room. And the first text is really fascinating too, because right from the beginning, Chad Sell is working with issues of play as they relate to self-image. And there's a young boy in this text who wants to dress up like a sorceress. And initially, um, one of the the, the um, neighbor kids sees him dressed up like this, and he's worried about what the other kids will think. But they actually are more than accepting of it. And that sells, I think, somewhat subtle way of putting forward the idea that how we present ourselves to the world is typically how or we should be able to present ourselves to the world as how we want to be seen. And so it is a wordless narrative. I was reading a review of this in School Library Journal of this text by Elizabeth Bird, and she had pointed out that she felt that it might be a little bit difficult for really younger readers to to pick up on this segment of the text initially because... On this um, first story? Yeah, on the first story, because it's a wordless comic, and sometimes those are more difficult for young readers to adjust to. But then a couple pages into the second chapter, um, it's clear again who this character was because one character says, oh, you're a boy, but no one makes any big deal about it. And so in that respect, um, I think it's really a a great commentary on how we can use imagination to to get a sense of our our true selves. But then later in the text, there's a character called Professor Everything, (laughs) who's who's very boring book smart. He reminds me so much of my nerdy self when I was a kid, because he he has this book called How to Make Friends. And he is very anti-imagination. He's into science. He wants everything that he sees to be real. And the kids have sort of rejected him in a way because they feel that he doesn't, he's not as imaginative as they are. And so he goes through all the steps in this book about like smile more, and, you know, and et cetera. But what he's not getting is the reason why the kids are rejecting him is because he won't play um, the way that they are playing. And so it's not just a text where, oh, look, these kids are, are being all imaginative. There's some depth to this and there's some real discussion amongst the characters about what they mean even by the concept of imagination. So it's, it's, I think it's very rich in that respect. Yeah, exactly. And interestingly enough, that chapter where you're talking about, uh, what Dr. Experiment, uh, (laughs) which is called the mad scientist comes right. almost at the very center of the text. Now, right. I, I, I don't know what to make of that, if anything, uh, but it's just interesting that this, uh, I guess, questioning, if you want to put it that way, of play and imagination mm-hmm. comes at the center of the book. Uh, and that, like, either right before or right after, it, it, it seems like that's when imagination wins out. Uh, and seems to be most prominent. But in the middle of the text, there's a questioning of this. Yeah, and you know, when we talk about Hope Larson's all summer long, maybe we can return to this idea. But a lot of times, one of the things I remember from my own childhood, and maybe you remember from from yours, is these kids look to be um, probably in anywhere from second to fifth or sixth grade. And, 
you know, there's always that interesting point for every kid where they start to to begin to be almost ashamed of child play. Um, very often, I remember for me, it was when, <clears throat> you know, I was still playing with my Fisher Price toys, and my friends had moved on to Barbies, right. And um, I, I, my mother got me a skipper, um, I was not allowed a Barbie. Um, <laughs> but I was able to have her flat chested friend skipper, which is fine, because I get where my mother was coming from. But you know, I, I then reluctantly joined into that play, because I had been perfectly happy with a toy that my friends now thought was like for babies. And and there's there's always that kind of divide between the kids who are still wanting to play and those who think that either play is frivolous or that it's for babies. And so it's really interesting. I think that that character sort of in a way is is there to sort of bring that that concept into focus as well. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we were we were talking about. um what professor everything and then the the mad scientist adding mm -hmm. little twists to the imagination um we also get that with and i can't remember her name but she is the girl who is the merchant who is the alchemist right she mm -hmm. basically is mixing lemonade or a variety of different <laughs> beverages uh in sometimes a haphazard way that makes people sick right. um and, and and so she you know if if we have the with you know professor everything and the mad scientist the prominence of reason over imagination then with her the alchemist we have commerce over mm -hmm. imagination and the potential dampening of i guess the liveliness of imagination because of that because now the alchemist is also in the chapter with what's called the blacksmith right and so mm -hmm. there's this young woman who makes weapons and she makes these really elaborate weapons cardboard weapons like a sword and puts beads on it or jewels or whatnot and and so um you know she's definitely using her imagination but it's the alchemist who is you know the one who is so business minded who attempts to put the blacksmith out of business mm -hmm. because she assumes that the blacksmith is trying to put her out of business, which is not necessarily the case. She's just um, she's just very self centered. Yeah, in and terms of her own business ac <laughs> acumen. Yeah, and she's drawn like I, okay, this is going to totally date me, but she's sort of the Alex P. Keaton of this text, I would argue. And yeah, for those yeah. of you who are too young to know that reference, there was a there was a sitcom in the nineteen eighties called Family Ties, and Michael J. Fox played the older brother of two uh, in a family of three, and he was obsessed with the Republican Party. He carried a briefcase to high school. He wore suits. He was Mister Proper, and his parents had both been hippies and were at Woodstock and they couldn't figure out how they'd gotten this kid, right? And and he's always bossing his younger sisters who are much more creative, et cetera. And in a way, this I'm looking, um, you know, this, this book is not paginated, which is like one of my least favorite things. But um, in the chapter that is, just a second, let me pop over, um, the chapter you're talking about, The Alchemist or The Blacksmith, um, the way that The Alchemist is drawn, you know, she has her little Oxford shirt and her, her little khaki shorts and her glasses and her hair's up in a bun. I mean, if you didn't know the context and you were looking at some of these images, you would think that she was a parent. Right. I mean, you know, in, in the way she's drawn, kid. she looks uptight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, seriously, whereas like the other, the, the blacksmith is like got rolling hair and she's very curvy and she's, you know, she's soft and everything. So there's almost this like, um, you know, binary that's being created here. Um, and so, you know, I guess what I would like to say about this text as a whole is it is it is a much more sophisticated text than it may seem at first. Um, and I think that that kids would really enjoy this who not only are interested in play and imagination, but are also interested in character studies because throughout the text, as you read the characters, they deepen um, that there's really a sophisticated portrayal of a lot of these kids. 
And by the end, you feel like you've really gotten a sense of the character of the neighborhood. You know, I would actually equate this in some ways to a book by Gary Soto that I've taught a couple of times. Um, and it's it's set in his neighborhood in Fresno, California. And it's a number of poems with different speakers all talking about their childhood in the barrio. And it's, it's called Neighborhood Odes. It came out in the early 1990s. And by the end of that text as well, you feel feel like you really know everyone in the neighborhood. There's loving depictions in that text of the library, the school, kids' homes, um, a park. And in this text, too, we get a sense for a lot of different kids' households um, about the economic status of those households, which differs widely. Um, and, you know, you really get a sense for how the kids have grown over the course of the summer, because it's really great at the end. They're going back to school, and they're, they're walking to the school school bus and it's this great montage of like what they look like in real life but like how they see themselves as almost the superhero group you know heading back to school so i thought that was pretty sweet right and you know you you were mentioning um real world situations and differences in household you know one of the things that really struck me about cardboard kingdom is when we get it's not quite halfway through but we get to the chapter the gargoyle mm -hmm. and we have a young boy who is going through a rough time at home because his parents are breaking up right uh his father is i don't know if his father is abusive but he definitely seems to have anger issues mm -hmm. and so he has distanced himself from his family because of his emotions and his attitude and his way of treating both the wife and and the son and so the son feels distraught about that, and the character that he comes up with, the gargoyle, mm -hmm. uh, is a result of his uh, his his father. And so the the gargoyle is like a guardian. Uh, and in fact, at one point, uh, the the father comes back home, apparently with I guess it's his girlfriend or someone that mm -hmm. he's involved with. And he's coming to get his stuff, even though the father knows that he's not welcome in the house, especially at night at that time. Right. And the son dressed, you know, in, in, with his cardboard outfit as the gargoyle tells him that he cannot enter, that he must leave. And then the father just shrugs his shoulders and then leaves. Um, but, but it struck me that, I mean, that is probably the most somber part of this text Mm -hmm. to see the young boy's situation with his parents breaking up and what that's doing to him. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I, I want readers to understand that, you know, these aren't perfect kids. Like Derek said, they're, they're coming from a variety of backgrounds. They have a variety of nurturing um, that is, that is given to them and that they give to each other. And I think that that makes it, you know, all the more interesting. Um, it's it's a very diverse, truly diverse cast of characters. We you know, even have one, bullies. Yeah, yeah, surprisingly. Whoa, and you know, there is one thing that um, that I do want to point out too, because um, usually when we talk about these texts, we also talk a little bit about style. And um, one of the things that I will say about this text is it is extremely colorful. And in fact, I think the color is doing a lot of work here that's important to mention. Um, it's it's not just sort of neon brights. It's like every color palette you can imagine. This is a really lovingly created text. And um truly a lot of, of attention and care went into um, using color to evoke emotion, et cetera. Um, not yeah, very just vi very vibrant, very. And, you know, not just, you know, um, it's interesting because it, it's sort of a, a fanciful clear line style, but, but a clear line that uses shadows. I'm looking specifically, I guess I just really liked, I really identified with, um, with Professor Everything, <laughs> he cracks me up. And, you know, he's sitting in bed at night looking at this book, How to Make Friends, and you can see him all alone. He looks really small, and the light that he's using on his headboard to read, his his face is cast in shadow on the wall, and it mm -hmm. looks sort of sad and mournful. And so there's just really cool ways that, that shading and color and light are used in this text. And it's really, really... Um, 
just beautifully done in that respect, uh, especially, I think, in a comic where actually a lot of this comic is wordless, um, a lot more than you would think initially, um, and a lot is conveyed emotionally through color. Right. You know, another thing, since you're talking about, again, that uh, Professor Everything chapter, I think that it's at this point that we're introduced to the humble scribe. Mm -hmm. And so he's a young boy who is basically going around and noting what the various kids are doing with their costumes and in their interactions. And every now and again, we see the scribe pop up in one of these stories. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we see him more prominently at the very end. You mentioned that they're going off to school. Uh, They're on a bus and the scribe shows, I think it's the kid who plays Professor Everything, Mm -hmm. uh, the book that he has as a result of the summer and making notes of what everyone was doing. And of course, the book that uh, or the notes, whatever you want to call them, that he has is called The Cardboard Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it may be slight in a way, but it's nonetheless a self-reflective move on the part of Cell where we have the scribe presenting a text that in essence we're holding in our hands. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, some of the best um, comics creators will do something like that. And I think it's really cool. And for kids too, you know, a lot of kids who are attracted to comics end up drawing comics and seeing perhaps someone who's a future writer, a future comics creator um, in action, I think is it's a you're right. It's a really subtle part of the text, but it's cool to see all the kids gathering around the book at the end and, and sort of looking at it, which I thought was a really cool image as well. Yeah. Now, be- before we move off of Cardboard Kingdom, I, I want to come to a point that you and I actually discussed right before we turned on the mics, and that mm-hmm. was uh, the the age designation for Cardboard Kingdom. Now, it's my sense from reading these three books that of the three that we're discussing on this episode, Cardboard Kingdom, All Summer Long, and then Be Prepared, this is the one for the younger readers. Yeah, I would agree. Certainly. Um, It's listed by the publisher as ages 9 through 12. Um, And I think that's pretty reasonable, but I would say that probably, you know, younger kids who enjoyed comics or, you know, parents who wanted to share comics with younger kids could do so because really most of this feels to me like very elementary school. Um, Right. Even though technically 9 through 12 is is sometimes designated as middle grade as a comparison, both All Summer Long and Be Prepared are listed as for ages 10 to 14. Mm. And, you know, by the way, those of us in children's literature scholarship debate age designations. We we sometimes use them if we're trying to create a syllabus and we want to, to be sure that we're not assigning texts that are way out of the realm of whatever the topic of our, our course would be. So if I'm teaching literature for the young child, I'm probably not going to be teaching um, all summer long, but I would consider teaching... Um, as maybe the last text in the semester, the cardboard kingdom, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, it's it's one of those things where when we 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 we're never quite quite entirely sure <laughs> about our listenership, um, and we'd love to hear from you. But I know that a lot of people who listen are educators, but also there are some parents who do listen, and we know that. And so we always try to give a basic age designation. But in this case, there's nothing in this book, I think, that would be at all problematic for a younger child. And it does definitely have the the, the conflicts that the kids are going through, the things that they're talking about, the way that they play definitely feels, you know, like elementary school. In fact, I would equate it if you're looking for sort of like it feels like this feels like the first half of Real Friends, um, a book that Paul and I reviewed last year. Um and, you know, again, deals with kids and friendship and the author's name, Shannon Hale. I just and um, I think it's um, I know she um, it's Luan Fang, I think, who Pam, who did the the art for that. Um, this has that very same feel. So if you liked Real Friends, this book is very much like that. Mm, OK. OK. 
Okay, let's let's look at the next text that we're going to be discussing on this episode, and this is Hope Larson's All Summer Long. And Hope Larson is someone that we have discussed on the Comics Alternative Young Reader Show and otherwise in the past. And in fact, uh, last year, Gwen, you and I interviewed Hope along with Rebecca Mock when their book Knife's Edge came out. Uh, so that was fun. But this is the story of a young girl, 13-year-old by the name of Bina, and she and her friend Austin – Every summer, at least before the present summer that we have in the text, uh, had been doing oh, – what, what did they call their – They call it a combined um, summer fun index. That's right, a combined summer fun index. And so what <laughs> they would do is they would go around and have I don't know, little adventures, make some observations, try to find things, and they would rate their various activities – according to some kind of, I guess, abstract fun index, mm -hmm. and they would come up with a score toward the end of the summer. And that was something that they always did. But when we get to the very beginning of all summer long, Austin tells Bina that he's going to go away for about a month or so to soccer camp. And Bina says, well, what about our summer index? And he goes, well, maybe it's time we set this aside. And so from the very beginning, you have a sense of growth, right? Mm -hmm. That we have young kids who are coming into their teenage years who aren't going to be able to do the kind of things that they were used to. And in many ways, kind of being forced sometimes by themselves to grow up and change in various ways. And that's what happens. And one of the things that changes Bina is her interaction with Austin's sister, Charlie. Now, it's an older sister. And when we first see Charlie, uh, she, she has a job as a lifeguard <laughs> at a pool. And it's a perfect job for her, uh, according to Austin, because Charlie loves to yell at people and get on their cases. And so as a lifeguard, she is sitting up on that, I don't know what you call it, the, the high seat. And it's just yelling at all the kids to not do this and make sure you do that and get off of there and don't do this <laughs> or that. And so that's perfect for her. So uh, at, at one point, Bina uh, encounters Charlie. This is after Austin goes off to soccer camp. And then they develop. A friendship, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And I think that institutes, uh, instigates uh, various changes with Bina as well. Yeah, you know, I know those of us who, who love children's lit are really excited that Hope Larson has done a single author text again. Um, when we interviewed her, she was working and is continuing to work on the Compass South series as the writer with Rebecca Mock as the artist for that series. And um, she did an adaptation of Madeline Lingle's A Wrinkle in Time um, a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really the first time in a long time that she's written for young readers. Um, her first book, Chiggers, was a middle grade novel set at a summer camp. And so this is the second foray for Larson, although I find it really interesting, um, you know, that she doesn't mention that text very much. But in fact, I would argue that Chiggers really was the text that that allowed Raina Taugemeyer to realize that she could do a memoir um, comic for middle grade readers and be successful. And a lot of other comics creators coming up saw the success of Chiggers and, and started to do comics as well. So it's really refreshing to see Hope Larson enter back into um, the world of, of um, single authored um, middle grade comics. And I will also say there's a color wash in this comic that I wanted to talk about at the very beginning before we get more into to kind of what happened. -ish. Yeah, it's a very summery feel. And at first, I will admit, Derek, that I didn't love it. You know, Larson got some criticism a number of years back for the color wash that she selected for A Wrinkle in Time. Um, she had this sort of ghostly blue color, which actually I think sort of fits with the themes and the, the locations in A Wrinkle in Time. But some readers had hoped that she would use more variation. So obviously, I think that Larson feels she knows what's best for her comics. And, um, you know, in Compass South that Rebecca Mock does the illustrations for, it's a multicolored text, right? It's it's on glossy right. paper. It's, it's, you know, but this, this is really back to I think what is Larson's comfort zone which is using various shades of this sort of orangey tint 
to not only draw the characters, but to set the mood. Um, sometimes the pages are very sunny. Sometimes the orange becomes deeper, combined with a lot of black. Um, in fact, there's some. I think there's a little bit of a nod there to um, to black hole. You know, there's there's certain um, <laughs> images that actually look like a really clean PG version <laughs> of Chuck Burns' Black Hole, and so you know. Um, I never but, thought we would discuss black hole on a young reader show. Well, see, here we go at young reader show. We're willing to delve deeply beyond young readers and bring in, um, bring in references. But actually I think overall it, it helps to set the sort of summer like tone for this text. Um, and we can talk about, as we move forward, when we talk about Brasco's Be Prepared, she also makes some interesting color choices to depict a summer. Um, and so we really have sort of the multicolored cardboard kingdom summer. And now we have sort of the, the orange summer, and then we'll have something else with Brasco. But um, to get back to sort of the, the plot and what's going on, this is really, I think, an interesting text because one of the, the, the things that we, we probably should point out is that that Austin's older sister, Charlie, is substantially older than these kids, right? Um, she is going into her junior year. Um, she she can drive, you know, I mean, she's definitely older. And in a way, the reader can sort of see right from the get go that she views um, being a more as someone she can mentor, um, rather than as a bestie friend, right. And being as right. really just looking, I mean, she's like Professor everything, she's looking for a friend, because Austin is clearly treating her in a way that she doesn't understand. And, and there's a really cool image at one point where it's clear that, um, that he is willing to um, post pictures of himself at soccer camp with his buddies. She calls them brotos instead of photos, which I think is way cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's posting all sorts of brotos on what Larson calls filtergram, right? Which is like Instagram, and but he won't text her back. And she can't figure out why. And so, you know, really, I think the friendship with Charlie sort of comes to the rescue for a while and what is otherwise a pretty lonely summer. That's right. Now, later on in the text, once Austin returns from soccer camp uh, and he starts hanging out with uh, Bina again, he does explain why he didn't respond to her in her texts uh, while he was away at camp. And and, you know, I won't I won't give the, that that away. But I mean, it, it does make sense to me. And I, th- I think that Bina Bina understands as well. Yeah. And, you know, there's a really interesting conversation that she has with her older sister, Davy, who has been out in the desert doing, I guess she does adventure stuff and, and is now heading off to Yellowstone or Grand Canyon or somewhere else. And she's, she's come home for one night to hang out with the parents and the little sister before she goes back out. And, you know, they have a really interesting conversation about maturation and friendship. And one of the things that Davy encourages um, uh, Bina to do is to pursue what she loves and that the friends will follow. And what Bina loves is rock music. I mean, her mom wants her to read the Odyssey over the summer. I love, <laughs> I love her parents. These are like my parents, you know, except I would have actually read the Odyssey, which is why I'm now an English professor and not a rock star. But anyway, um, you know, she looks at Telemachus and she says, no, Telecaster. And she jumps out her bed and starts playing the guitar, mm-hmm. um, you know, and ultimately she has the opportunity to meet one of her idols who's a um, up and coming guitarist and the guitarist basically encourages her to start her own band and ultimately what being one of the things being learns from the summer is that she doesn't always have to have the exact same interests as her friends and she can branch out on her own and do the things that she's really passionate about right and and you know the scene that you're mentioning when she uh, encounters the lead singer of the band that she's all a gaga over, right uh, throughout the text steep streets um this, I guess, beginning around page 116 and 117, this is an example of something that you were pointing out earlier. And it's not just the orange wash, but it's the orange wash with heavy blacks. Now, right. it, you know, we have a lot of black because things take place at night and it's inside of a club. But one of the things that struck me visually about these pages, and I'm looking in particular at page 124 and then 125, yeah. this is when we first see uh, Steep Streets. Um, the, the, the orange really stands out 
again, speaking about the visuals, uh, set against the black background here. And I think that it's this scene that is so significant and arguably a turning point uh, in some ways for Bina. Um, And so I think that the visuals kind of leaping out at you and being so much more, I think, noticeable than the visuals that we get earlier uh, is not an accident, that this is an important moment in Bina's life. And can we just take a moment to talk about the opening band? It's called... (laughs) Bijan Frise, but it's spelled Bijan, (laughs) F-R-E-E-Z-E. I just love the the do-it-yourself punk scene, and that is just so perfect. Um, That would be a band I would have wanted to front. But yeah, even on the next page, too, the the, um, you know, Bina really stands out and she almost has a halo around her head because she's standing against a back black, a black background. Her hair is black. And then there's this wonderful little halo of orange that differentiates her from the background. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's almost, you know, like she's glowing and she really is because she's being taken seriously by another musician. Mm-hmm. And so you're right. I think that that the the color and the panel placement and just even things like shading, et cetera, work together to to really make that a momentous moment. Um, yeah, a momentous moment in the text. So mm-hmm. exactly. So anyway, I I you know this is listed as ten to fourteen, but I could see even older readers finding this to be kind of cool. Just especially um, the the way that Larson does an actually really good job for someone who must be in her thirties by now of um, showing the way that kids really kind of talk to each other and the way they use technology and how sometimes even technology stands in for friendship in good and bad ways. Um, she really does a nice job of that too. I think some older readers. Would appreciate it. Right. And, you know, as we were pointing out, uh, at, I guess, at the beginning of our conversation of uh, All Summer Long, you know, this, I think, is arguably a coming-of-age story, but it's a different kind of coming-of-age story. You know, many stories like that tend to... I don't know, have kind of downer elements to them. There's something Mm -hmm. kind of darker and depressing and much more somber, maybe is a better way of putting it, um, given the change. It's like, yes, we're going into something new, but at the same time, we have to leave behind something that we had once possessed. And so there is kind of a sadness or a somberness to the narrative. Um, There doesn't seem to be much somberness in All Summer Long. Uh, I mean, there is change. There is evolution. Uh, both Bina and uh, Austin grow up and change and uh, evolve in certain ways, but there doesn't seem to be any sadness or hard feelings ultimately. Yeah, and also, like, everyone is shown to be going through changes. Um, Bina's older brother and his husband end up adopting a baby, and so they're going through that change. Her older sister has just broken up um, with someone and is is sort of heading out to to try and find, um, you know, herself on her own. So everybody is going through these transitions, and in some ways that's very comforting, you know, that at every point in life, even the parents you see, I mean, suddenly you see that mom and dad are going through – through some changes as well. And, and I think that's really subtle. I should also mention that, um, you know, it's pretty clear that Bina's dad is white and that her mom is, is black, I think. And, you know, that again, we're finally at a place where that isn't really something that makes a huge impact on the whole text. Um, also, I think that it's possible, certainly her brother is queer, her sister may be. And um, again, it's just refreshing to have these things show up in the text and not necessarily be the, the entire center of the text. Right, um, it's normalized. It's, it's a very diverse group of people living in her neighborhood, um, you know, and uh, the, the friend groups are diverse. And it's really nice, as in Cardboard Kingdom, to sort of see that being being played out. And again, you know, you know me, I will call something out if I think that it's problematic. And I just don't think this text is at all problematic. I think it's beautifully done. And I think Larson is really sensitive to adolescence. And especially, I think, to Southern California adolescents. Um, I used to spend my summers out in um, in Phoenix, Arizona, which is sort of the, the slightly poorer cousin of L.A. And, um, you know, this had a very familiar vibe to me. 
Um, so I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done. And it's, again, really nice to see Larson um, illustrating her her words um, because she's she's really good at panel placement. There's a number of places where she, for instance, evokes noise or emotion through panel size and shape. And it's just really great to have her I, I I really love collaborations and we love to talk about collaborative work, but it's also sometimes nice just to have a single author comic. And this one is really good. It is. I agree. Derek, let's move on to our last text that we're going to be talking about today. It is by the wonderful Vera Braskell, who is known to our readers perhaps for her wonderful story, Anya's Ghost, which won a lot of acclaim. It was her first graphic novel for young readers. And she's following up with a memoir comic. Um, it's called Be Prepared. And if you've ever been in scouting, you will know that is one of the important mottos. And it focuses on the summer between fourth and fifth grade for young Vera when she attends Russian summer camp in the hope of finding friends with whom she'll have something in common. The opening vignette in the novel focuses on young Vera's sense of cultural and economic isolation. She's an immigrant from Russia and the daughter of a single mom. She has a little brother as well, but they're living in um, in sort of a, a very small apartment on the East Coast in a, what is otherwise a pretty prosperous area. And she's often to sl- slow to pick up on the latest trend Um, The American Girl (laughs) dolls are featured in this, and all of her friends have some variant of this kind of doll, and um, she is simply unable to approximate the lavish birthday parties that her classmates' parents throw for their children. Um, And at the end of the school year, um, she listens to all of her friends talking about their great summer plans, and she feels really envious because she doesn't have any cool summer plans. And then, when she's at her Russian or Orthodox Church, she learns from Kesnia, a Sunday school friend, about a Russian heritage camp called Aura. And she's certain that it will not only be fun, but it's going to give her something to talk about with her friends at the end of the summer. And what she does experience is certainly life altering. And I have to say that that just before we even begin, I so identify with young Vera because I am not an outdoorsy person and I endured three years of summer camp at Camp O'Fair Winds in Lapeer, Michigan. For those of you <laughs> listening who are my friends, you know Camp O'Fair Winds. And this reminded me a lot, although we had slightly better toilet facilities. Beyond that, this felt a lot like Camp O'Fair Winds. Yeah, it reminded me of my time in Boy Scouts when in the summer I would go to Camp Grimes and uh, now, see, that sounds that sounds like a Dickensian name in Grimes, it, it, you know? It, it it does. It does. And and you know the thing about Camp Grimes is when I started going to it, in fact I was one of the first groups of scouts that attended because there had been, and I can't remember what the older one was called, but there was an older summer scout camp in, in that the the Charlotte Mecklenburg area of North Carolina would send the the scout troops. Uh, but Grimes was new. And so when we first started going there, it was unfinished. <laughs> so, uh, so we, uh, we had to deal with that, but the toilet facilities are very much the same as we find in be prepared. Now, l- let me, let me step back for a moment. If I, if I can, now you were mentioning Anya's ghost and I think that came out in what, 2011. So that had been a while since she came out with that book. Now, in between Anya's Ghost and this one, Be Prepared, she had a a picture book, didn't she? Uh, Leave Me Alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I I wonder, I mean, and you, I mean, you know of uh, Braskal in her work much more than I do. I mean, I've read uh, Anya's Ghost. It's been several years, but um, is is there a reason why she kind of stepped away from the graphic novel form? Well, I think probably this book just took a long time. Um, that's my my sense. Um, I haven't 
I'll be honest, I haven't had a chance to read any interviews with her recently, but my sense is that this was a book that was a long time in the making. Um, she she had, I think it's Olive's story is the one that, um, no, actually, no, there's Anya's Ghost, and she was doing a lot of what looked like children's books up until that point, and then she became... Um, one of the drawers on the Gotham Academy Endgame special, and then Leave Me Alone was the picture book, and now, you know, be prepared. And it may just be that it took her a number of years to draw this. You know, it's it's a lengthy text. It is. It's, I mean, you know, from a from a um from a stylistic perspective, it's pretty complicated. Mm-hmm. And um so it may well be that she just really wanted to take the time to to make sure that it was everything that she wanted it to be. Yeah, okay, makes sense. But it is pretty much an amazing book and and when we talk about color wash, this text also has a color wash. Um and it's uh, it's it moves from sort of what I would call olive green um, there's a lot of black blocking used in this as well. Um, we have another heroine who has black hair, and so that you can always pick her out in a crowd um, because many of the other young women, most of whom are called Sasha or Natasha, <laughs> um, you know, all of them have lighter hair than than uh, than um, Vera. But um, in a way, what's really interesting about this text is that you know Vera's reasons for wanting to go to camp are that she wants to impress other people. This isn't about a deep, I mean, she, she, the way that she talks about her love of the Russian Orthodox church is that it's the, the repetitiveness of the ritual. She doesn't understand half of what's going on in the mass, for instance, but she thinks it's beautiful. But when it comes to going to Russian summer camp and learning more about her Russian heritage, what she really wants to do is to, um, is to have something to show her friends. And you see this, um, there's a really cute place on, I believe it's um, page 19, um, or no, I guess a little further along, where it's the last day of school and she knows that she's going to this camp. Oh, it's page 36, sorry. And um, she says, fourth, the, she's, the narrator says, or Vera says about herself, fourth grade dragged on forever, but there was finally something fun at the end of it. And you see a picture of the teacher up at the chalkboard with your summer plans and Vera's running up to the front of the room. And she shows this gorgeous little cartoon that she's drawn of herself at what she thinks camp will be like. (laughs) And it's big, sunny, and everybody's holding hands. And there's, you know, it, it looks beautiful and clean and there's flowers on the ground and everything. And the reality is it's sort of this camp that's run with very good intentions by a bunch of camp <laughs> camp folks who it's very rustic it just it it puts the rust in rustic it is so <laughs> so rustic and and she you know she drags her little brother to camp Phil and Phil does not want to go he's completely resistant he likes to stay inside and read and draw and he does not want to go and Vera's like we are going to this camp buddy and of course, the irony is once they get there, Phil immediately is taken into a group of, of peers his own age and is having a blast right away. And poor Vera gets put into a camp uh, or into a tent with two 14 year olds. Now, Vera is between fourth and fifth grade. So she's like nine going on 10. And um, these two girls are called Sasha. Both and of them, yeah. Yeah, you know, from our generation, this is like Heather's, you know, the movie Heather's where everyone is just called Heather. It's mm-hmm. like they're, or I, I would think of Mean Girls would be another good comparison. These are like the plastics, right? They're they're obsessed with their looks. They are, they are fawning over this really mean bully, but he's very cute at camp called Alexi. And they all want Alexi to notice them. And they're upset that they have this little, what they probably consider to be a peewee kid in their tent that she's going to cramp their style. And initially she just has one mishap after the other, because this is a young woman who really has found out pretty quickly that she does not like rustic living. Right. Exactly. Now, you know, you mentioned earlier the kind of green olive wash. Uh, Mm -hmm. We should mention that the colors of be prepared are by Alec Longstreth. Uh, yeah. whom we have discussed on the show before. We even had on for an interview a number of years ago. A really, really great guy, great artist as well. Um, and, and I think that the green is appropriate given the context because, you know, as you were pointing out with the orange, 
in uh, all summer long. That does have kind of a summer look to it. It, it. it suggests visually summer. And then the green definitely suggests the outdoors and, right. the, you know, the, the trees and the forest. And, you know, it, it, at times things get a little dark. And I think that that darkness is represented in the text as well, including some of the darker greens. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really interesting for fans of Anya's ghost. They will know what that ghost looks like. And later in the text, um, Vera makes a friend who looks so much like the the, the ghost from Anya's ghost. And she oh, I hadn't also, thought of that. Yeah. And she also looks a little bit like the ghost in Nightlights. So there's it, it's interesting because after all, this is a memoir and Vera Brasco is drawing herself as a young artist. One of the ways that she ends up making friends, genuine friends, is through her talents as an artist. And, and this is Kira is this friend. Kira is the friend. Kira is about, the right, friend. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because it's almost like there's this little, you know, echo. Maybe the ghost and Anya's ghost physically and some ways reminds her of this young woman who she knew when she was a little girl. So there's just that. Um, and really, it's the first time in the text when Kira emerges where I felt like I was I was definitely reading a Vera Brasco text. And part of that is because both the the coloring and slightly the style is a little bit different here. Anya's ghost focus was, first of all, put out on very glossy paper. It was mainly blacks and purples. And um, and I would argue that the, the, the art was a little bit more angular, and whereas this has a much more natural feel to it. And um, I would argue that, that Vera depicts herself um, almost in an iconic mode with those big eyes, you know, and everything, because in part, she stands out so well. Right. Um, as you're reading through the comic, I mean, you're basically following her throughout it. You can pick her out of any scene. Her hair is different than the other characters. And so that's actually really helpful to the reader. But um, but when Kira emerged, it was the first time that I really felt that echo to Anya's ghost. And that's a testament, I think, to Braskell's um, versatility as an artist and to the way that this text definitely stands on its own. Um, and by the way, it's much longer than than Anya's ghost um, by, by, I think, twice as long. And yeah. Um, so it's a much more sustained narrative. And as it turns out, it's not just a text that focuses on Vera's coming of age, or at least her growth, but on the the growth and coming of age of other people at camp, including um, I, Gregor, who is the son of the head counselor, and who is just like he he's nerd personified bless his heart and <laughs> you know in a way there's this really interesting scene that occurs a lot in children's literature where one character who's kind of been teased and ostracized sees another character being teased and feels at least initially a sense of relief um that someone else is being um she's one of the things that she said is she's uh, it's on page 153 she says um as she's seeing gregor being teased she says um, it, I, I felt it felt sort of good to see someone else suffer, but then, <laughs> but then she 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 comes to realize the cruelty that's going on, and she tries to stand up um, in some ways for Gregor. And I think she we see her growing as a person. Um, and really, this is another text about friendship. One of the very nice camp counselors called Natasha, um, you know, says to to Vera when she notices that Vera is winning friends simply because she draws them nice pictures. Um, you know, she points out to her, Hey, look, you know, real friends will like you no matter how talented you are, or whether you don't have those sort of talents. Yeah. Um, you don't want to buy your friends. And in a way that's a theme that works through all of these texts that we've talked about today, not just the summertime theme, but the idea of summer as a time when people not only define what friendship means, but grow and mature. And so, um, you know, here we are in September, just finishing another summer. And um, it seems kind of fitting to, to talk about these books in this way. Right. Now, you know, I want to get back to a point that you were making about Gregor and how Vera in, in some ways kind of stands up for him or at least mm -hmm acknowledges some kind of empathy with him, it, 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 and she does. On the other hand, and if you'll notice on page 156, she inadvertently makes fun of him and then kind of revels briefly in right. the, the results of that because Gregor gets, I think, a stung right on the yeah, forehead, right in the middle yeah. of the forehead, and Vera makes the observation, hey, look. Oh, no, he said, uh, he looks like he's got a nipple on his head. 
and then <laughs> a couple of the other campers Alexi, say, "Alexi, the really the the the, the good looking boy." Yeah. yeah says, says, so he starts calling him Tithead, and then so everyone around Gregor starts making fun of him and calling him Tithead, and. Then the other campers kind of look to Vera. It's like, hey, good one. And so she briefly revels in that yeah. acknowledgement. Right. And then ultimately, I think, comes to realize she has been wrong. And, you know, she has this interesting epiphany in the woods, which feels intertextual to me with another book. And here I go with my, my perhaps in this instance, forced intertextuality. But um, they've, they've gone off on this special hike into, I mean, I, I really felt like they were already in the middle of nowhere, but apparently they needed to go even deeper into the middle of nowhere. So they are truly in an area where there's not a lot of human habitation. And in the middle of the night, Vera wakes up in her tent and hears this sound that she's never heard before. And she walks out into the darkness and we get a full page spread beginning on page 168 of this absolutely gorgeous moose, huge moose, who's standing under the moonlight drinking out of a pond. And the moose looks at Vera and Vera looks at the moose. And she just has this sort of moment of like incredible transcendent happiness. And it reminds me so much of um, images out of Zhou Jing's The Only Child, which came out in uh, a couple of years ago. And we actually also talked about on the show and uh, where a child is brought to sort of transcendent happiness by um, wildlife in the middle of sort of a desolate scene. And, but it is a really beautiful moment in the text and kind of the payoff after page after page of talk about latrines and crappy food and <laughs> just really bad clammy conditions and everything else. Um, Vera has this really transcendent moment, which she wouldn't have had if she hadn't gone to camp. That's exactly right. And in fact, that, yeah, that, that does become almost an epiphanal moment, uh, because it's after that that Vera seems to, um, adjust herself to her surroundings and to try to make the best of the little time that she has left in camp. And then, of course, it's right after this that she makes the friendship of Kira as well. So, I mean, this does seem to be an epiphanal moment, kind of a turning point in the text. Right. Uh, right. And in fact, I mean, you can't help but but notice how important this scene is because, as you point out, it's a two-page spread. And I think it's the only instance we have in this text of a two-page That's spread. That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in a way, it's the image that you could see her drawing back in fifth grade when she gets back to school of what she did this summer. You could absolutely see her drawing a picture of that moose and standing up in front of class and showing that. So, you know, it's it sort of ties things together, too. She has had this great experience, probably, and in ways that she didn't anticipate. And I think that's that's one of the things that makes this text um, awesome. But it also is replete with lots of other things that one expects from middle grade and early YA literature, including the apparently obligatory girl getting her period and then people telling <laughs> and her not wanting people to tell. So so lest you think that this book is all about beautiful epiphanies and or latrines, it's also about coming of age in that way as well. And so it, it fits in nicely with, um, with some of the thematic focus of a lot of YA girls texts, especially. So, so there is a little bit of everything in Vera Brasco's Be Prepared. Yeah, you're right. Um, you know, I, I want to say a couple of uh, words about my, I don't know, experience uh, in reading Be Prepared. Now, when we get to the opening pages and she's with her friends and the focus is on birthday parties and how she so much wants to fit in I, that part hurt <laughs> it it just seemed yeah. extremely painful and i felt very uncomfortable for vera given the situation that she was in and how how desperately she wanted to fit in and be accepted by the other girls and that it, it was painful to read. Um, I mean, in a good way, right? I mean, it's not like right, it turned me off right. the text. Um, now we have some of the similar kind of wanting to fit in dilemma going on in the text that follows when she goes off to camp. But one of the things that differentiates the camp part from that opening sections with the birthday party in her trying so hard to 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 be wanted, fill you know, to to fit in and all that uh, with the other girls is the humor is that Broskull tempers 
whatever dilemmas, as dire as they are, that Vera is in <laughs> at camp with humor. And I think that that goes a long way of making things, I don't want to say readable, but let's say less painful to read. Yeah. And from an immigrant perspective at camp, she's with other kids who may be going through the same thing that she's going, going through back at home, which is um, they stand out. They have, many of them have were born in Russia or, you know, definitely Russia, Russian is spoken in the home because um, they have to speak Russian at camp. And so in a way, even though Vera is being teased, she's being teased by kids who are a lot like her. And her, her, I think you're so right, Derek. I think her conflict is really at camp is somewhat different. And I think that humor fits there because they can just be themselves, right? They can just be kids as opposed to trying to fit in with other kids who maybe come from different backgrounds. And mm -hmm. so I, I agree. I think because really part of the pain in the first part is you can even see some of the kids' parents understand what Vera's going through. And you get the sense that they really respect Vera's mother as a single mom for working hard to, to get a good education and to go to college and to try to better herself and find a good job. And by the end of the text, um, spoiler alert, but it's not that much of a spoiler because the text isn't about this, but Vera's mom does actually get a really good job based upon her hard work and the family is going to move and be in better circumstances financially. But at the beginning, it's both Vera's poverty, but the way that the, that, that the cultural norms in her home are different. Her, her English is something that she's still working on. And then she just feels so isolated. It is painful. Um, those that that first, you know, 20, 20 or so pages just really are kind of heartbreaking. Um, but you're right, the, the mood changes. And there's still those sorts of things. She's still upset about a lot of things, but it has a very different feel. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I wondered if you were going to mention the end. And you didn't go into complete detail, and we can just leave it at that. You're right. The mother does get a job. But it's a different kind of job at a different kind of location. Right. And that's where we end the text. And I thought that that was interesting, especially given, let's say, the last two panels on page 244 and then that that single panel that's primarily in black, framed in black on 245, where right. we have Vera's reaction to what her mother has just told her. I couldn't help but think that this is the introduction to – uh, Braskal's uh, memoir autobiography tempered with uh, fiction part two, you know, right. That, I, I that we're going to get another begging for a sequel. Absolutely. Exactly. You know, so, and I hope that that's the case because she's led a very interesting life. And I, I guess because I love comics so much and I love comics creators so much, I always find their childhoods to be interesting. And it is important in this text as well. You know, you're talking about in Cell's Cardboard Kingdom where, um, you know, actually in all three of these books, the there are protagonists who are artists. Um, and if you look at the poster that – Bina creates to get people to join her band. It's pretty dang artistic and mm -hmm. she's going to be a musician. So, you know, this Braskel really is going to be a comics creator and you can see um, the way that she, uh, the way that she uses her art to not only express herself, but to, to tell people about who she is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So fun times. <laughs> Wow, Derek, <laughs> we have been through a lot today. Just in, in like a, a little over an hour, we have gone through three really awesome texts. And uh, I hope you enjoyed doing the, the Young Readers gig. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. Yeah, we, we started off with Chad Sell and, and Gang's uh, The Cardboard Kingdom. After that, we looked at Hope Larson's All Summer Long. And then we wrapped up with Vera Brog, uh, Brosgall's Be Prepared. So they were three really good books. And for this to be my first outing, so to speak, with the Young Readers Show, great choices. Yeah, and I'm glad you to did be a part a, of this one. You did a wonderful job. Thanks so much, Derek. I'm not Paul, though. No, you're not. We miss Paul so much. Or Andy Wolverton, for that matter. Or And Andy we miss as well. But you did a really wonderful job, and I know those guys will be listening too. So hi, Andy. Hi, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot.
Um, yeah, and if you want to find great books like this, as Gwen pointed out at the top of the show, then definitely check out the website of our sponsor, which is Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and there you're going to find a whole slew of discounts, including 30% off of Be Prepared, which we just discussed. So it's a great book. You can get it there at a wonderful price. That's dcbservice.com. And after you do get your texts there, get in touch with me and Gwen and let us know what you thought about this episode and if I screwed it up too badly. Uh, If if you go to our website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you could leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can contact us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Or you can contact us by email at two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Gwen at comicsalternative.com. Derek, how can people reach you? Interestingly enough, Derek at comicsalternative.com. <laughs> and we're all over social media. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. And until next time, I'm Gwen. And I'm Derek. See you soon.